Okay, so we're talking about ancient Greece now. Ancient Greece. So we've moved from the uh, Near East, and now we're talking about the ancient Greeks, the actual start of Western civilization. When you think about Greece, you should uh, have some images that come to mind. Here are a couple that come to mind for me. For instance, uh, men talking. The word rhetoric, the word philosophy should come to mind. The word democracy should come to mind. The Greeks are the ones who invent the idea of representation and voting. And then uh, architecture, Greek architecture, these columns and then triangular tops. So we still copy this about the Greeks today. Um, it turns out, though, that uh, the Greeks that we think about as those classical images, there's actually Greeks that predate that. For instance, the earliest of the Greek civilizations is one called the Minoan civilization. The Minoans predate these, the classical Greeks. The Minoans were found by an archaeologist named Arthur Evans. And the turn of the century, around 1900, about 100 years ago, Arthur Evans, an archaeologist, started uh, excavations on the island of Crete. And on this island, he uh, found some objects and then excavated further. And he began to uncover palace complexes, actually all over the island of Crete. Um, some palaces, some lost palaces just buried by time. And he began to uncover these. The largest of them was at a place called Canossus. And there are other sites, but the largest and most interesting is at a place called Canossus in the center part of Crete. Um, he found a palace complex over 100 acres, 185 acres, covered with ancient ruins buried over time. And the, the rooms are actually in kind of a maze, kind of a, a maze of rooms. I'll show you a picture in just a second, but they're, you would follow these passageways through rooms in a basic maze or a labyrinth. And uh, estimated population, if you count the number of rooms and multiply by four or whatever, uh, an estimated population, maybe 12,000 people lived here in this one complex. So this is uh, a lot of people living in these various complexes all over the island of Crete. And they even found plumbing and sewage. That's very impressive. These ancient civilization had the ability to bring fresh water in and get rid of their excrement. Um, this is going to make them very healthy. Here's a couple of pictures. There's a picture of Crete here. Today it's a vacation place for Europeans. And then uh, this is one of the ruins here that was uncovered. You see the beautiful columns. And it's unlike anything else. It's unlike the Egyptians. It's unlike the classical Greeks. It's kind of this, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, this lost civilization. Here's a uh, picture of the complex itself at Canossus. All the rooms, this palace complex. And it would have been uh, even layers upon layers of this, actually, like apartment buildings at Canossus. Here's an artist's conception of what it might have looked like with layers and uh, levels and gardens. That's an artist's concept of what we think it might have looked like at its best. Uh, but the most impressive thing is the art. I mean, obviously, whenever you open a book of, the, of Minoan, or if you were to Google Minoans, uh, the art is going to pop up, and it's just so beautiful. Um, you're talking about an island, so you're going to see lots of pictures of fish. There's some dolphins and fish. Here's a young boy with his catch of fish. It's just uh, a style of art. It looks, it looks sort of Egyptian in that the man is standing uh, sideways. And then it looks a little bit Egyptian, so maybe some Egyptian influence. And uh, lots of nature pictures. Here's some pictures of a baboon. Here's some monkeys. And then people, pictures of people. Uh, beautiful women with jewelry in their hair and fashion. And then uh, men carrying pottery, wearing just uh, loincloths, just beautifully tanned, dark-haired people, a lost civilization no one knew about until Arthur Evans found them. We call them the Minoans, or actually Arthur Evans called them the Minoans. Uh, he coined that term, and they didn't call themselves that, and we don't know what they called themselves, but he's going to call them the Minoans, and the name is stuck. Uh, the reason for this is because of bull images. The most famous of them is a picture of bull leaping that was found. And there are other bull objects, bull heads, bull symbols. But the most famous is the bull leaping, a scene of men he catching a charging bull, flipping onto its back, and then flipping off. What were they doing? You know, is it some sort of bullfighting? We don't know. Is this even possible to do, to flip over a bull's back? But the bull images brought to Arthur Evans' mind the idea of a Greek legend 
the Greeks had talked about a legend of King Minos or King Minos. And so the legend goes that there's this king, King Minos, on an island. And so Crete is an island. And he would leave the island to go to the shore, to the mainland, and demand tribute. He would arrive at your city on the mainland and arrive and demand tribute. He didn't want money. He wanted men and women, young boys and girls, to feed to his son, his Minotaur. The gods had cursed him with this half-bull, half-human son. And so as anger and get payback for the gods, he would demand this tribute and feed these young people to his Minotaur. And the Minotaur lived in a labyrinth, and he would drop the young people off there, and they couldn't escape, they couldn't find their way out, and the Minotaur eventually would eat them. And eventually, a Greek uh, hero comes up, a young man captured as tribute, and then he finds his way into the labyrinth, and uh, well, Minos' daughter helps him, uh, Ariadne, helps him find his way out, and he kills the Minotaur. So that's the legend. Does it have some base in reality? Well, you've just uncovered an island, a lost civilization, and uh, a labyrinth of rooms and bull symbols. And so this is why he calls them the Minoans, the, because of the legend of King Minos. Other things he found kind of draw interest. Uh, he found this idol here of a woman, a bare-breasted woman with uh, snakes in her hands. We call her a mother goddess or a snake goddess. Um, this is found in other civilizations, a woman female goddess of some sort, and then uh, he found writing. So this is a civilization. It's not just a lost people. This is a civilization, Minoan civilization. He found writing, and he could not read it. Um, in fact, we cannot read today Linear A, a form of writing that he found on a disc, and uh, then he found other writing, so he'll call this one another type that he found, Linear B. And this one was solved. In 1952, someone actually solved Linear B as a half of some form of early Greek or something. But Linear A is still unsolved. And this isn't unusual. Um, there's a lot of languages that have been started and died off. But Linear A was some form that we haven't found any other thing like it and cannot solve it. And so uh, there's a mystery there. What, uh, what happened to these people? Just, you don't find bodies in destruction. It's just, there was a civilization here. It was obviously very beautiful, and it just stopped. So it's a bit of a mystery. What happened to these people? And um, so they date from around 1000 B.C. and then gone by 1450. Just gone. We talked about 1200, the time of the Sea Peoples, when civilizations were falling. But this predates that. So this would predate the, the Sea People arriving. So uh, we know that they were sea traders from the island of Crete, which is in the middle of the Mediterranean. They could trade in all directions. We know this. We found objects there that show that they were trading with everyone around them. Their main staple seemed to be olive oil. We found warehouses where olive oil jars would have been stored. So this must have been their main staple. Olive oil, not just for cooking, but for uh, cleaning on your body and uh, for fuel, for lighting. And lots of jewelry. As I showed in the pictures, a lot of jewelry and fashion, a lot of precious stones, a lot of pay, paying attention to art. And no defenses. This really strikes people, uh, especially historians, that you're in this island in the middle of, the middle of the Mediterranean and there don't seem to be any defenses. The palaces do not have walls around them as such. You don't find weapons. You found a couple of arrowheads and a couple of axe blades, but no great military system. No defenses on an island that seems to be pretty wealthy. So, the theories abound. Was it a tidal wave caused by an earthquake? Did they just, you know, did they leave? Did they get out in time and just never came back? Uh, volcanic eruption. This one actually holds a lot of weight, that there's an island nearby called Thera, where half of the island exploded at one point and, uh, because of a volcano, and maybe this dumped the ash down, much like Pompeii, except further away. Uh, Thera exploded and dumped the ash or poison gas onto the island. Another theory, probably more plausible, is that somebody showed up and uh, took them away. Just uh, savage people showed up and found the defenseless wealthy people and just hauled them away. So that's, this is probably the theory I would go with, one of these two. Could be a combination, we don't know. Another civilization, switching gears now, another civilization besides the Minoans is one called the Mycenaeans, the Mycenaean civilization. 
And you can tell by the picture here, this is going to be a little bit different, a lot of warfare. This is going to be the people of Troy, the Trojan War, the Mycenaean civilization. This one was found by an archaeologist called Heinrich Schliemann, a German archaeologist, and he found it in the 1870s. And what he was doing was he was looking not for so much a legend, but actually from a book. Um, the, the book is called The Iliad. And the book describes cities and a civilization of these really ancient Greeks. And the, the classical Greeks had this book. The classical Greeks had it, talking about a past civilization. So was it real? Was the book the Iliad, the fight for Troy, was this real? Or is it just simply a legend? Legends usually have a basis in truth. So he began looking for the cities, including Troy, looking for the cities of the Iliad. The story of the Iliad is that the Greeks... Uh, got angry when a Trojan man stole a, a Spartan woman named Helen. Helen, beautiful Helen of Troy. Um, she was originally from Sparta, stolen, taken away to Troy. And the Greeks launched a thousand ships to get her back. Her face was so beautiful, they launched a thousand ships. And a great war of the Greeks against the city of Troy. So where is Troy? He began to look for where Troy could possibly be. He began excavations along the Greek coast and along the Turkish coast. Um, along the Turkish coast, he'll think he'll find Troy eventually. But on the Greek coast, he found a, um, a ruins at a place called Mycenae. It's up on this top of this hill, um, right in the, in the, in the Peloponnesus. Uh, there's discoveries at a place called Mycenae, and that's where the name comes from, is that his first discoveries at a place called Mycenae, and so who called them the Mycenaeans, all his subsequent finds, will be like these Mycenaeans, and so he'll call this, these people the lost Mycenaean civilization. The Mycenaeans. Dating from about 1600 to 1100. So it actually uh, will match up a little bit with the uh, Minoans, in that this may be plausible that these are the people who white knocked out the, the Minoan civilization. But this civilization flourishes from 1600 till about 1100, and this will be the one that gets wrecked by the, by the uh, Indo-European, the Iron Age invasion, when that'll bring that to an end. What he finds is a series of fortified cities around the Greek coast, not just at Mycenae, but at other places, fortified coastal cities. Cities with walls around them, cities with fortified areas. A very warlike people, when he finds their graves, they will have weapons and armor in there. So this is not the Minoans. The Minoans with no weapons, the Mycenaeans fully armed, warlike people. He also finds that there's no unity from one city that he finds to the next, from one ruin to the next. There doesn't seem to be a unifying element. There's nothing in common. And this would fit the book. The book, the Iliad, describes that the Greeks have trouble fighting the Trojans because the Greeks don't get along very well. They can't, have a, they can't find a leader. It's difficult to herd them together. They're each doing their own thing. And this seems to fit the ruins the archaeological evidence. One of his discoveries is this face here, this mask of a king. It must be a king. Maybe that's Agamemnon, the mask of Agamemnon. Uh, but he finds these in great burial crypts, actually fantastic burial crypts. The cities are up on hills and then dug into the side of the hill. Sometimes underneath a dome are these great burial crypts and they're just full of objects. Today they're in museums. A uh, mass grave sometimes, a king would die and then be buried with his servants, and lots of gold, these people were fighting for gold, and lots of jewelry from all around the Mediterranean, and then lots of weapons, lots of weapons. These are warlike people, armor and weapons and helmets. So this does seem to fit the story. The Iliad is a book of war, and these people are very warlike. So it does seem to fit Homer's book, the Iliad. Homer was the guy who, whose name is on the book, the Iliad. What the Iliad is about, again, is the tale of the city of Troy and the Greeks fighting this war against Troy. The Greeks call it Ilium, which is why the book is called the Iliad. And it's just to confuse you, how come they just don't call it Troy and we call it the Trojan War? Well, they called it Ilium, and so the book is called the Iliad. It's the war against Troy. The Greeks had to get together. Difficult getting them together, but they fought against the city for nine years. And then the book picks up. The Iliad picks up in the 10th year as they're waging war for their 10th year and finally attacking the city of Troy. So it's a 10-year siege by the Greeks. It's about heroes. Every chapter of the book it introduces you to a new hero and these various Greek heroes and these various Trojan heroes. 
as they fight and they, they call each other out on the battlefield, man versus man combat, as they dance and insult each other and uh, compliment each other and wage war in, uh, on, the, on the plains in front of Troy. The most famous example is Achilles. He is the greatest Greek warrior and he's very moody. He has been um, told his fate. He's been told that if he goes to war, he will definitely die. And then um, he has also been protected, that his whole body has been protected. He cannot be wounded by man-made weapons except on his heel. And then he's also been told that if he were to avoid war, he can live forever. He could be a god, basically. And he makes the decision to go to war. So a lot of people like that, that he chose to die in glory rather than live at home. Uh, the other, the Trojan hero, is a guy named Hector. And Hector is a much more interesting guy to me anyway. He seems very patriotic. He loves his family. He loves his city. And um, he's reluctant to face Achilles. And then he finally has to face his greatest fear, his greatest nemesis. And spoiler alert, um, Achilles wins. He does defeat Hector. And then the book ends right about there, which surprises people when you're reading the book. Like, I, where's the horse? Where's the Trojan horse? Well, that would be in a book in the middle. We think this is actually a trilogy. The Iliad, and then a book in the middle, which we don't have, and then the final book, the, uh, the Odyssey. So we have Homer's Iliad and his Odyssey, and um, we're missing the middle book. So we have these two books. They're basically going to be the Greek Bible, instructional 